I'm delighted to introduce you to the speakers of the KCVD Council Symposium on Blood Pressure Genetics 2.0, Beyond Monogenetic Investigation. We're gonna have very short um, summaries of the presentations and a couple of questions. I'm Alicia McDonough. I'm from the Keck School of Medicine in Los Angeles. And our first participant is Adriana Hung um, from Nashville, Tennessee. Adriana. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for participating in Hypertension 2020. Uh, the study that we will share with you today um, is one of the largest transit studies done in genetic determinants of blood pressure. The main component of this study was the million veteran program cohort. Uh, the MVP currently is the largest biobank in the world uh, and is a research created by the Veterans Affairs to advance genomic and precision medicine. Right now we have 800,000 individuals that have uh, enrolled in the study and we have 450,000 uh, available DNA uh, results that we're using in our analysis. Uh, this study was conducted with uh, two other consortia, the ICBP and the BPIs and two other biobanks as UKBP and BioView to bring it up to a sample size of about 750,000. These types of resources are very informative. Uh, the first step uh, was uh, a phase of discovery. So we run genome-wide association studies analysis. It was a transit -like approach, which is important because it allows us to learn about genetic variants that are present in minority groups, which is uncommon. We had up to 80,000 participants from African-American population and Hispanics population. Um, but one of the greatest things of this type of study is that after you have completed your GWAS, you can do post GWAS uh, bioinformatic approaches that allow you to bring this into a more translational context. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the things that you can do is that you take all those genetic variants that you identify and you run them against uh, databases for uh, drug targets. So one of the greatest things is that you can explore drug repurposing uh, and uh, drug discovery. Uh, but in general, this type of uh, analysis and results, what they really do is that they provide a very uh, comprehensive catalogs of genes that participate in the homeostasis of blood pressure. Uh, so people can take different parts of it and bring it into their own translational question. Thank you very much, Adriana. So um, how do you imagine that scientists at the lab bench will exploit this? Just in a short comment. There's different ways. They can choose um, their genes of interest and they can explore using different techniques, let's say organoids, uh, drug responses to a given genetic variation. Thank you very much. Uh, our next participant is Tanika Kelly, who is from New Orleans. Tell us about your project, Tanika. Thank you for inviting me here today. So, you know, observational studies have documented high salt sensitivity or high blood pressure response to dietary sodium intake as an important risk factor for hypertension. And given the relevance of high salt sensitivity and potentially high potassium sensitivity in the development of hypertension, we were interested in whether a genetic risk score for blood pressure could predict these intermediate or endophenotypes. We hypothesized in our study that those with higher blood pressure genetic risk score would display increased salt and potassium sensitivity compared to those with lower blood pressure genetic risk scores. So we tested this hypothesis among participants of the Genetic Epidemiology Network of Salt Sensitivity, or GenSALT study, who in addition to having genomics data had completed a seven-day low sodium, seven-day high sodium, and seven-day high sodium plus potassium feeding study with carefully measured blood pressure measurements at baseline and during each intervention phase. But surprisingly, we observed an association opposite of what we expected, identifying an inverse relation between blood pressure genetic risk score 
and salt and potassium sensitivity of blood pressure. So on the basis of these findings, we cautiously speculated that salt and potassium resistance could act as mediators between genetic background and elevated blood pressure, representing novel markers of future hypertension risk. Thank you, Tanika. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations for clinicians when their patients come in with high blood pressure or for the general public <laughs> based on these very interesting and provocative findings? You know, I believe that randomized controlled trials have clearly demonstrated the blood pressure lowering effects of increased dietary sodium intake or of decreased um, dietary sodium intake and increased potassium intake. Um, our study was really not designed to establish any guidelines for sodium and potassium intake in relation to blood pressure. Here, we've simply suggested a novel determinant of hypertension development, but I think the mechanisms really need to be further investigated and elucidated. Thank you very much. Our final participant is Dr. Tule from Rochester, and she's done a deep dive into a molecular pathway that's regulating kidney injury and blood pressure. Thank you for having me today. So I just want to summarize our research um, that has taken us to this point. Um, we became interested in the gene called GSTM1 from a mouse model of renal vascular remodeling. And um, we then uh, identified that is, it plays a direct role in oxidative stress. Having the gene um, uh, modify or decreases oxidative stress, whereas deleting the gene increases oxidative stress um, in vivo as well as as as, ex, as 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 well as in vitro, and then we then took it to the human uh, populations of the AS cohort as well as the ERIC or the atherosclerosis risk in community cohort, and identified that those that have the null allele or have lack or loss of expression of this gene are more likely to have kidney disease progression or, or more likely to have uh, a risk of kidney failure. And so we then went back to the mouse model and deleted the gene and identified that not having this gene actually increases susceptibility to kidney disease in two different mouse models, uh, both the hypertension model and the um, a reduction of kidney mass model. We also showed that um, that having a loss of this gene within the parenchyma drives renal inflammation uh, rather than uh, not rather than the bone marrow. So it's really deletion of this gene uh, in the tissue rather than the bone marrow. Uh, it drives a, a inflammation in the kidney, and because this gene is actually a downstream target of the nerve two pathway. Um, which is stimulated by actually a substance called sulforaphane that is derived from cruciferous vegetables and, and um, broccoli actually has the highest abundance of sulforaphane. We therefore tested it in the mouse and identified that uh, uh, having consumption of, of the broccoli, uh, uh, sulforaphane rich broccoli powder actually decreases inflammation and injury in in the mice that only lack GSTM1, whereas uh, the wild-type mice do not de did not derive any benefit from this. Then we went back to a human population and also showed similar observation as we found in the mouse, that humans that lack the gene uh, are having the null, or are possessing the null allele, actually derive more benefit from high consumption of cruciferous vegetables, whereas humans with the GSTM1 active allele or possessing the enzyme um, did not derive a benefit from, from uh, high intake of, of cruciferous vegetables with respect to incidence of kidney failure. Um, so I will stop there and take any questions. Well, it's, it's very interesting work. So I have one short question, which is, what's the incidence of the null allele in the human population? But then my follow-up question is, how do you introduce precision medicine to address this specific population? That's, that's a great question, um, Alicia. And so um, the, the null allele is actually quite uh, prevalent in human populations, in Caucasians and Asians. Um, it, the homozygous state for the null allele is actually about 50%. 
and in African Americans, it's 27 percent. Um, and uh, also noteworthy is that um, all of the uh, GWAS platform um, it, it actually does not, ha you know, they, they do not have any single nucleotide polymorphism that actually uh, represents the, the null allele uh, very well. And so we would have to actually genotype um, uh, in, a spe in a different manner. Um, but, but following your question regarding the precision medicine, I mean, clearly what our, what our study shows is that there's a gene diet interaction and that, you know, to derive a benefit from a particular diet, it's really dependent on what the genetic makeup is. Um, and, and certainly our next step would be to actually uh, test uh, moving forward, you know, maybe uh, supplement with sulforaphane uh, and, and looking at a disease progression over time in somebody with chronic kidney disease, but also genotyping them at the same time to determine their response to the, to the supplement. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all, um, all of our speakers, all three of our speakers, uh, for a wonderful session. And it, it's an exciting, uh, beyond monogenetic investigation, lots of possibilities. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.